Hi, welcome back to CVN 305. Today we are actually going to look at a full scale structure. Up to now we have looked at all kinds of pieces, right? I mean, we looked at stresses in small pieces like little rectangular pieces and things like that. Uh, we also looked at pressure vessel, which is our only structure, which was extremely simple because it was all of one piece. Right? Today we are look at we are going to look at combined structure. First example of a combined structure or joint structure. And I am going to show you the overall process for how to deal with any combined structure. Certain structures you can do it in a little bit of a shorter way, but in general, this is our process. And if we know what to do, then it's actually a fairly straightforward thing for us to figure out how to do certain things. Okay, so let's look at an example. So rather than talk about it in general, I'm going to look at a specific example. And the example is the following. Example is a light fixture is hung as shown below. So here's the light fixture, here's the roof. I have two wires and I have a light fixture here. Okay, and the distance is 3 meters. The center of mass of this light fixture is somewhere here, 1 meter. This dimension is 3 meters. Okay, and it's given to us that the light fixture, the mass of the light fixture is about 300 kilograms. Okay, so it's a fairly big light fixture. I'm not talking something that's in your house. I'm talking about like in a stadium or something like that. And you have this gigantic light fixture, 300 kilograms is a lot of weight. Okay, that's hung by these two cables. Okay, 3 mm, I mean 3 meters dia. Okay, and uh, what we want to find out is the following. So we have designed it already. So we know all the dimensions, presumably. It's already out there. Somebody wants to install it. And before they install it, they want to figure out, verify whether it is safe and whether it will deflect too much and cause it to tilt. Notice there are several qualitative words. Well, there's this word safe. There is this question of deflection. And what the heck does it mean to say too much? So we have to convert it into numbers. This is actually one of our central jobs. Okay, as engineers, this is what you have to do. So if you want to convert it into numbers, we are going to say safety means Wires won't snap. Okay, that's what we mean by safety. In reality, there will be a huge list. For example, you could say wires won't snap, uh, the joints, the connections won't break. Right? The uh, it, You will not get an electric shock. There are so many aspects of safety. Okay. And most of this, it is actually a bigger problem during installation. So I want you to understand that in many cases, the safety issues are much more important during installation. That's where many of the problems come. 
once it's been installed, it's actually reasonably okay. There are cases in which things happen after installation, usually because something else changes, like your roof tilts a little bit or your roof beam breaks. All kinds of things can happen. So guarding against the, guarding against this kind of unexpected catastrophic events is actually at the heart of, of, of structural safety. So this is a perfect example of what we meant by structural safety. Okay. So this is all we know. So how do we go about dealing with this kind of a setup? So first thing is we have to estimate external load. How do we do this? I, I remember I told you what is the job of a structure? Structure is a means to constrain objects. You remember this? So the load comes from the object that's being constrained. In our case, what is the structure doing? It's trying to locate, place or constrain the light fixture. So that is the origin of the load. Okay. So how much load is the light fixture applying? Well, it's 300 kilograms. In our case, it's 300 kilo, kilo, kilograms times 9.81 which we will round up to 3000 newtons, which is three kilonewtons. Okay. So we have identified how much load. The second thing is this is steady or dead load, which implies I can do statics. I don't have to do dynamics. I don't have to worry about fatigue or cycling, cyclic loading, this, that, nothing. It's just statics. Excellent. So step two. So that's estimate load. Step two. What are we concerned about? This is usually called safety requirement. In our case, failure of wire at in the middle. What do I mean by in the middle? I mean, I'm not looking at the joints yet. I'm looking somewhere here. Will it snap? Okay. And deflection. Okay, so that's what we are concerned about. We don't really care about whether the light fixture will break or something like that. Yeah, light fixture can break. You know, if I made the right light fixture or let us say, um, you know, poor poor quality concrete. So I try to hang it. The light fixture itself will fail. Of course, nobody will make a light fixture out of concrete. I'm just giving you a crazy example. It could happen. But my point is, you have to, it's not like there's only one safety criteria. So for each safety criterion, you have to go through an entire, entire calculation. I want you to understand that. This is what we do to ensure safety. And if you miss something, that will come back and bite you. So that's why we sit there and we, and we train and we train and we train and we practice and we practice and we practice until we are good at figuring out what is it that we want to do. Step three. What information might be useful? So think of it this way. If I'm thinking like a cooking recipe, what are the ingredients? Right? Or if I'm thinking of my junkyard analogy, what are the pieces of junk that we need? So this is a structure which is static, right? So first piece, definitely I will need 
something about equilibrium. So this is piece number one. Piece number two, I am interested in deflections. So I need something about Hooke's law. And this is usually called material analysis. This thing is called load analysis. And I need to know something about strains, strains and stresses and all that. Stress, strain, modulus, material. All of this goes into deflection. The third piece that we will need has something to do with the fact that things are connected. That means they cannot move independently and they are constrained and hence they are constrained. This is the trickiest part of the analysis. This is the, what is that? This is the one that you are most used to. This is not so tricky, but relatively straightforward. Tedious, but straightforward. And empirical. I also need something about failure criteria. Look at how many pieces I needed here, right? But this is rel relatively straightforward and empirical. Hooke's law, there is no deep, deep idea in it. I mean, now, that is after, after working with Robert Hooke for more than 300 years, we are okay with it and we say, okay, this is some empirical rule that connects forces and deflections. Same way with Tresca criterion, you know, von Mises criterion, the maximum normal stress criterion, whatever it is, it's just a way for us to say, okay, you know what, um, it's just an empirical rule. This last part has to do with geometry. And this last part is a tricky one. The fact that things are connected, this is the new element we are adding to what we have done up to now, this idea of connected things. So let us look at this thing carefully. So let us start. So now we, now we start doing each of this. Step four, load analysis. And our assumption is all deflections are so small that we can ignore them for equilibrium. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, if I go back to my light fixture, imagine for a moment that this is made of like a bungee cord, not not a not a piece of steel wire but of a bungee cord so what will happen the whole thing instead of looking like this it will look like this right the bungee cord will extend a lot and because it's not exactly centered it's going to tilt on one side right and you really have to acquire, apply equilibrium to this not to this, right? So if really this thing was made of bungee cords, I cannot do the equilibrium calculation without knowing the deflections and I cannot know the deflections without knowing the equilibrium calculation. This is a much harder problem. That's one of the reasons why we like almost rigid structures. So our idea is to make things easy 
we are going to assume that our structure is almost rigid. This is a very critical assumption. If you don't have this, we are dead. But this is an assumption. You have to go back, check, finish your calculation, check all the deflections to make sure that you could, you could say, yeah, it's almost rigid. Okay, it's an assumption. And in some cases, it will be bored now. Most of our structures are okay, but sometimes it will not be. Okay, so now let's go. And since it is that way, I can draw the free body diagram. So first thing, what are we trying to do? We are trying to find forces in the wires and on the um, light fixture. For our current problem, we are not really interested in this, but we really need to know the forces in the wire because that's how I figure out whether it is going to fail or not. So I draw a free body diagram. So, so just to get you an idea of where I'm going to draw the free body diagram, I'm going to draw a free body diagram of this whole thing. Okay, so I'll go up there, I'm going to do that. So. F1, F2, 3, 1, weight is W is 3 kilonewtons, right? So if I do summation of the forces, upwards positive, I will immediately get F1 plus F2 equal to 3 kilonewtons. Summation of moments, so let us call this point A, and this is point B. Summation of moments around point B, counterclockwise positive will give you 3F1 equal to F2. So, notice two unknowns and two equilibrium equations. Which implies this is called statically determinate. Statically determinate means that I can find the forces using only equilibrium equations. So I can tell you statically determinate means that I can find the internal forces using only equilibrium equations. We should always strive when we build stuff, we should always strive for statically determinate systems. That's really what is really important, okay? Because from, from the point of view of being able to do these things properly, this is a very important idea, okay? And typically, statically determinate only works for almost rigid bodies. If the body is like a bungee cord, you cannot do, you cannot even find the forces without knowing the reflection. So statically determinate is meaningless for them most of the time. We had, in fact, our thin wall pressure vessel was also a statically determinate system because we could find the internal forces, the hoop stress and the normal stress without knowing how the thing deflected, right? PR over T, PR over 2T, you know, all this stuff we did without knowing how the thing deflected. Same thing is true here. Notice I looked at the equilibrium equations and I can conclude that it is statically determinate. So immediately I can find out that F1 is uh, 3 over 4 kilonewton, F2 is uh, 9 over 4 kilonewtons okay so that's very nice and at this stage I can go ahead and I can look at failure criteria and so on but I will do that in a second okay I don't worry about it right now so we will we will now look at 
Force analysis is over. Now we will go and we will look at material properties. Okay, so first thing material type. So this is step five. So this is where we use Hooke's law and other things. Okay, first thing material type is steel. Okay, and let us say Young's modulus E is twenty two hundred ten. Thousand, um, two hundred ten thousand newton per millimeter square. That is two hundred ten thousand megapascals. Yield stress is two hundred fifty megapascals. I mean, these are things that I can look up for the type of steel. Okay, so this is not a big big deal. So now. We can check for yielding. So, actual stress in the material So now, we are at the stage where if you remember from last class, we were looking at this bar, right? And in this case, what's happening to the bar? Is it obvious to you that there is only tension? Sigma xx or sigma axial is the only force on it. There is no there is no sideways force, there is no bending, there is no torsion, it's a wire, right? So what happens is, my stress state looks very simple. Sigma xx, which is along the wire, will be F1 over A for wire 1 and F2 over A for wire 2. All others are zero. Right, so immediately you will find that sigma xx will be 750 newtons divided by, now you need to know the wire diameter. So let us assume that the wire, so you go and you actually have to measure the wire diameter. If it is an actual device, you have to ask yourself, what is the diameter of the wire? If they say, we don't know, we are trying to pick the wire, you have to pick some number. In our case, we are going to pick a 4 mm dia wire. So you will find that area is pi over 4 times 4 squared which turns out to be 12.57 mm squared. So sigma for wire 1 is 210, 750 divided by 12.57 which is 59 MPa. Okay, if you do for the same thing for wire 2, I will get sigma xx is 225 mm newtons, sigma 2 will be 225 divided by 12.57 which is uh, 179 MPa. Okay, so wire 2 is not that safe. Both of them, of course, are less than the yield stress, 210, less than 210, but wire 2 is not that safe. You are getting close. Okay, so be careful about that. Okay, so, so we get an idea of what this, uh, of what this setup is like. So you get an idea of what we are trying to do here. Okay, so then we now need to do deflections. And with deflections, what we know is, if I use Hooke's law, since sigma xx not 0, sigma yy, sigma zz, all the others are 0, you will find that epsilon xx is 
sigma xx times e which turns out to be 750 divided by sorry times sigma xx over e which is 750 divided by 210 1 2 3 that's a pretty small string okay for wire 1 for wire 2 it will give me 225 sorry 9 over 4 right yeah so 1225 So it's not 225 kilonewtons, it is actually 9 over 4 kilonewtons. So let me fix this, the numbers are not correct. So this one is um, 2.25 kilonewtons, which turns out to be 2250 divided by 12.757. Sorry about that, I got the units wrong. Okay, so 750 divided by 210. For wire 2, it is 2250 divided by 210,000. Okay. So, this is epsilon xx for the two wires. This is what Hooke's law will tell you. Now, you have to know what is the definition of epsilon xx which tells you u1 over l1. This is u2 over l2. That is the definition, right? Deflection. Sorry, uh, and in fact, the book sometimes calls it delta. So I'll say deflection of wire one over L one. This is deflection of wire two divided by L two. In fact, this is a very important result and a very useful result. So I'm going to write it in this way. Deflection of wire equals force over area that is the stress divided by E this is the strain times length right right so this is F L over E A and the way to remember so deflection is F L over E A which I can write it as F L slash E A and you can remember it as flea F L E A you know the little insect that can jump a really high that one okay and by the way the reason why a flea can jump really high is because of its elastic response in its leg so it's ideal to think about the fact that the deflection of a wire is FL over EA. So it's a very easy one to remember. You just have to remember flea. So once you remember that, that's easy. So U1 is F1 L1 over EA1, which turns out to be 750 divided by 210,000 times 12.57 times 3000. What's this 3000? 3 meters converted into millimeters. Remember that. And that turns out to be 0.9 mm, approximately 1 mm. U2 is F2 L2 over E2 A2, which turns out to be 2250 times 3000 divided by 210,000 times 12.57, which is 2.5 mm. Notice that if I check, so small deflections, check. So it is, it deflects only by a small amount, okay. So now that I have U1 and U2, now what has happened is my original configuration was like this, right. My new configuration is slightly longer here, slightly longer here and it has tilted like that. Can you see that? 
and our idea is the light fixture itself is rigid so what will happen is it will tilt like this so this was the original length so this is how much these two things have deflected can you see that and the question is what is this angle so i'm going to draw this large and you can see how this works so here is the deflection of the first one here is the deflection of the second one this is what has happened right so this is u1 this is u2 so i want to draw this triangle here this one is u2 minus u1 this one is 4 meters so this angle theta so so angle theta so tan theta is u2 minus u1 over 4000 remember the units which turns out to be 2.5 minus 1 divided by 4000 which is 0.000035 radians which turns out to be 0.02 degrees so no problem the light fixture is going to be quite safe and it's going to tilt so i want you to understand that we have done a fairly elaborate process starts out with equilibrium then we went to material properties we checked for yield and we look we used hooke's law in the form so what happens is we can always for wires and things like that this is the form of hooke's law we are going to use that is our flee form so you don't have to do much you can go directly to the deflection of the wire if you if you just use hooke's law in this form because it, it combines everything okay and so then what we did was we did little bit of geometry at the very end so this is what we mean this last part is called compatibility analysis or constraint analysis and enables us to do a variety of things uh, we will later see that this compatibility analysis requires you to actually do some drawing and some trigonometry always comes to that and this is the hard part there is no simple way of doing this so you always have these three parts what are the three parts you have to do equilibrium analysis you have to do material analysis basically hooke's law yield stress all of that stuff and then you have to do compatibility analysis which says how are the different pieces connected what will happen before you have to do a before picture and after picture and whatever used to be connected still stays connected that is our basic idea converting it into a mathematical equation is not a simple thing okay in our particular case in this particular case it was just a matter of drawing drawing before and after so here is the before figure here is the after figure and if i draw before and after i can use trigonometry to find the angle of tilt okay with that we are done